Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dyers of Space Explorers with me, your host, Gavin Tolometti. Now in this episode, we are going to learn about the history of space technology and how you can do substantial research into a topic about space outside of academia. We speak with Amy Shearer Title, who holds a bachelor's degree with combined honors in history of science and technology and classics from the University of King's College and Dalhousie University, and a master's degree in science and technology studies from York University in Canada. Amy has gone space blogger, space YouTuber, and now space author with her books, Fighting for Space, Apollo Pilot, and Breaking the Chains of Gravity. So without further ado, let's get right into the episode. So, Amy, I wanted to ask you, it's like, for getting into the history of space technology, how is it that you came across that field, um, if we want to go back to the beginning? Yeah, my, my, um, I definitely have, like, the moment that turned me into a space person. Um, I was seven, and I was researching for a school project on Venus, which, you know, is was going to be a very minimal thing because you're seven years old. And uh, I just thought it was the coolest thing ever, that it was like roughly the same size as the Earth, but roastingly hot and spun backwards. And its day is a year long and it has no moons, but you can see it without a telescope. And it was just like so cool to my seven-year-old brain that there's so much variety in the solar system right in our backyard. So I started reading more books about space stuff and came across, I had this book, I actually still have this book. Um, it's like a thousand one facts about space for kids, you know, as it existed in 1992, uh, to completely give away my age. And, um, there was a two page spread on the moon and there was a picture of two astronauts standing in front of a lunar module. And I was like, wait, people went to the moon. Why was I not informed? I was just like, it just like blew my seven year old mind. And, uh, you know, you're in Canada. I'm from Canada. It's NASA is not everywhere in Canada and space. I mean, space was not as big in the nineties, I guess. Um, yeah. So it was just like, I had never heard of this. And I was just like, I need to know why. And like how? And then the more you ask that question, the bigger the answer gets. And it's just spiraled from there for like a lot of years. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, seeing all those images of the Apollo landing just made a lot of us when we were very young question, question like, wait, this actually happened all the way back then? Why is this not yeah. happening now? Can this happen again? And it's just like all these questions come to our heads. Yeah. And as you said, the how and the why of g yeah. getting people there was a the big question, I think. Yeah. And yeah. And since you said you're from Canada, and yes, you mentioned that usually when we hear about space, and especially in the 90s, we just heard NASA, 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 NASA. I mean, it's, it's still mostly NASA, NASA, NASA. NASA's yeah. like NASA, NASA, SpaceX, NASA, SpaceX, SpaceX. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. The two of them. And yeah. occasionally you just hear the Europeans and Chinese sprinkled in. Yeah, in there. basically. And because um, like being in Canada, um, it took me a while. But before I came to Canada, I didn't know that Canada had its own space agency. And yeah. I know there's still a lot of people in Canada that don't even know that they have their own yeah. space agency, which. Yeah, it's it's hard when, you know, the CSA has done stuff. We built an arm, <laughs> which is on the five. I think it's on the five dollar bill or is it the ten dollar bill now. Um, but, you know, and we turned out Chris Hadfield. Those are the two most forward facing parts of the Canadian Space Agency. And both of them were launched and flew because of NASA. So it's really, it's very easy to kind of lose the fact that Canada does have a space agency when a lot of it is done through the U.S. space agency. Yeah, when the U.S. space agency does like lead so many missions and they have, I mean, their budget is so much bigger, so it does kind of make sense, but at and the like, same- The infrastructure and the ability to launch. I mean, a launch site in Canada, you're not gonna find a good launch site in Canada. Um, so, you know, it makes more sense to launch, to partner with NASA, but also like NASA's got the infrastructure, NASA's got the back, background to, to be able to do it so it all, it all makes sense yeah it all makes sense but part of you always wishes that oh i wonder if my own country could just like take the lead and launch something yeah. of their own like 100 percent uh canadian at that point or yeah. for me if i was to go back home 100 percent british but i know that's probably never going to happen anytime yeah. soon uh yeah wasn't england the second country to launch something though but i think they hitched a ride on a different satellite. Um, no, I think. Rocket. No, I think the. If we're thinking overall, I know the Americans were second, but I believe it. Then Canada so, yeah, was second. third. 
No, Canada was third. I think Britain started launching stuff, but I think they were tacking satellites onto NASA launches pretty early, like in the 60s. And this is the other thing you don't really think about is like how many countries were actually doing stuff because it was all like, you know, we see the space race part. You don't necessarily think about like the satellites and the, you know, tell like Telstar is the one that comes to mind but like there were other things happening at the time but anyways I do know other countries were involved I do not know the timeline off the top of my head <laughs> but it is interesting to think about how many were involved but never with their own programs so couldn't have that same notoriety yeah it, it does make you wonder that you if every space agency released a timeline of what they did and someone was meant to use their own time to piece together a giant uh, space mission timeline com- Buying everything together that would probably be interesting but at the same time I'm trying to imagine how condensed and overwhelming that must look <laughs> must yeah look like. yeah i feel like i looked at a, a, a launch list of like 1960 once and like if you take the u.s and russia out obviously because we know they're doing stuff there was like four three or four other nations that were starting to look at payloads yeah i think really? yeah yeah, no, I, I agree. There's like so many things happening that we don't realize were happening yeah. during the Apollo program because yeah. that was such a big uh, program right. and mark of history at the time. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of history, though, um, it's it's so you were during your bachelor's, you went to go to get a degree in the history of space technology. It's history of science and technology. Science and technology. Yeah. Okay. I don't know me. anywhere where you can uh, specify in space. I had to self specialize in space a little bit. Okay, so the, what is it that made you want to specialize in space at that point? So, um, I, well, I was already, I was already like, like I said, I already had this like deep love and fascination with spaceflight history, and you know, through high school and everything, just like reading as much as I could about it. Um, but I also didn't, I wasn't like the best at math, <laughs> um, so like following the engineering path was probably not going to be my way, and I didn't really know what to do um so it was just like i i didn't know what to do but i had this love of space that i knew was a thing and i just happened to end up at a university that had history of science and technology as an undergrad major which is not a thing that i'd ever heard of before um i went to kings in halifax and um it, it was like it taught me that you can actually study history that's made of science so you can engage with science through storytelling and through the human side without having to do the hard engineering and have all the math stuff. And and it was great because like the the core courses were basically like the history of, of Western thought through science, <laughs> which was just so cool to be able to trace everything and see kind of, you know, the ancients did this, the Greek pre-Socratic. And I also paired it with classics. So like I was reading the ancient Greeks in the original Greek and then like seeing how different translations affected science in the the early modern era and like brought it into the, the modern era and how much we learned. And it's just like this very cool overview. And um, realizing that there's a lot you can do and there's a very powerful way of doing it through storytelling and um that's kind of how i ended up sticking with history of science and just i you know just wrote my master's or my undergrad thesis on uh the reaction to sputnik because it was 2007 so it was a fitting date (laughs) yeah that's kind of how that worked it really just like i fell into the right program and i was able to focus on space as much as i could and because you took that ability of learning how to talk about science and exploration through storytelling to science communication engagement, because it's such a big, important skill to use in that field. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, my, my life is SciComm. I mean, <laughs> I completely fell into that one too. Just like did not expect it at all. I, I, um, I actually did a degree after my undergrad in, and I have a degree in corporate communications and public relations, (laughs) Um, which was just like not the best fit for me. And I went back and I did a master's in science technology studies, which is also not the best fit for me. And then I was like, I don't know what to do. So I took a year off to try to figure out what to do if I wanted to apply for PhDs, where to go, what to study. And during that time, I was I started writing a blog just to kind of play around with ideas, because like when you apply for PhDs, you have to come in with like your research plan kind of sketched out a little bit so they know. So I was kind of writing this blog to figure out like, what do I want to spend five years researching? But within a few months, the blog started to get some traction and it was just, you know, within space circles, which is kind of it's a very small community um, and then wider circles and stuff. And I was like, maybe I can just do this writing thing. And it was just not at all what I was expecting to happen um and it just I, and then i just kind of never went back to academia <laughs> well i mean like you so you found out like when blog writing that 
it was definitely it, it was the thing that you wanted to do in the end like was it a quick realization yeah. or did you know did it take a little bit of time re- getting into it before you realized um, actually this is what I want to do I don't want to go back to academia I knew I've always wanted to write I've always been a huge book nerd um I the one thing I don't like about this shot that I always do for interviews here is that you can't <laughs> see the giant bookshelves I have <laughs> um but I I've always loved books I've always wanted to write and I, I just didn't know what that meant um because you know when you're in in undergrad when you're in university it's everyone's always kind of like, well, if you want to write books about a topic, you get a PhD and then you're the expert and yada, yada, yada. And then it turned out that like, I've done way more work as an independent researcher than I ever did in school ever, like without question. Um, And it's just like, I think, you know, coming from an academic background, I know how to do it. And like, I just, I just decided that, you know what, I'm going to try to do this without having to spend five years doing stuff that satisfies someone else's requirements, which to me is kind of like what a PhD feels like. Um, I'm I'm sorry for anyone who is actively excited about a PhD. It was not for me. It was just not for me, you know? Um, I just, I didn't want to sit there and have to do all the, the required courses and comps and stuff when, you know, five people were going to read this thing that I spent five years on and then, and then not know what to do five years down the road. So um, I ended up writing my first book in that time frame instead. And it was just as researched as anything else. And it was great. I had so much more fun with it. And it was, I got to share it with people and actually enjoy teaching people weird stuff they didn't know about German rocketry and the history of how rockets got into America and what happened once America imported all the German scientists and mixing it with all the weird human factor studies that were going on at the time. And it's like, this is, this is a scope of stuff that's really fun and it's stuff that people actually want to know about. And you don't have to do it from the confines of academia. You can do it differently. No, I agree. I think it's like a misconception that everyone feels like if you want to be an expert in something like, oh, you have to get your PhD or else no one's going to take you seriously, which is not really true. It's that there's a lot of like you're one good example that you don't need to get a PhD, that you enjoy doing the research through outside of academia. You're able to probably do more than some other um, researchers as well to get all this information you enjoyed it and it's something that you love doing as well yeah yeah it's uh it's I will say it's nice to be able to research stuff and not worry too much about having to you know get apply for grants and stuff (laughs) um yeah no it's 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 interesting I mean I don't get me wrong I'm I'm coming out of academia with a master's was also very useful because it really taught me a lot about research and taught me a lot. I mean, I'm sure you've done papers where you have to do historiography and stuff and like show your work. And I, I love not having to write that, but also understanding how to look at sources. Um, and it's, it's. T- I mean, I learned so much that I apply all the time. I just like that I get to do the same research and write about it with a really strong narrative and actually make it a story that engages people. Like my my new book is is designed to be written in a way that makes you feel like it's fiction but we have 43 pages of of sources (laughs) um we actually i my editor my editor emailed me one day she's like okay we had something like 1500 footnotes in this book and she's like okay so i don't think we can actually print it with footnotes because the book will be 600 pages long (laughs) i was like okay fair okay let's find let's find a way to show the work without having to do a 600 page tome because there was a page in the first proofs that was like this much text and then just like a wall of footnotes I'm like yeah that's terrible oh someone will think you're trying to reprint the original Lord of the rings book <laughs> it was it was it was nuts like the book is already big and just like adding all that stuff in it was like a huge thing it's like let's not <laughs> yeah let's make it readable and approachable because at the end of the day and this is what i love being able to do it as from a freelance perspective is like people want to learn about this stuff and anyone can understand science if it's explained in English. Yeah, so no, yeah. Do that. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, I can't say this because I literally talk about rocket science, but it's not rocket science. Also, <laughs> rocket science isn't that hard. It's a controlled explosion. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been, it's really fun to be able to take that stuff and break it down for the average person. And like, yeah, you get to reach people and excite people. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, I love it when I get to find material that is, is able to explain something that I am nowhere near familiar with and make it accessible for me. And this is actually, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start this podcast, because I wanted to make space itself uh, more accessible in another way. And I feel like sometimes scientists who are very stuck when in their bubble 
it, it's, it's hard for them to break it and realize every, everything you're saying that only about maybe 5% of what you said in a seminar probably was taken away if you're lucky, I think, Yeah. in that case. But I think fi- learning how to explain it in a much better way that everyone can understand really can get the message across and it makes people more engaged to want to learn more. Yeah. Which. Yeah. Yeah, I always say if I, you know, post like one of my videos, um, which are, you know, they're still pretty detailed, even though they're not like getting into every detail. If someone watches it, they they learn something new and they, they're just like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And have that little moment of like, this is cool. I learned something. That's a win. That's a huge win to be able, especially in like the current state of everyone's obsession with like instagram and <laughs> and social media and stuff i i really like when i post something about a weird thing that happened on the way to the moon and people are like i had no idea this is very cool i'm like cool go about your day and just ha- happy to have this little moment of like joy in science <laughs> hey you take your weird fact for the day yeah. up from there it's like how i love learning about um the weird facts of technology that we got from space exploration where we had no idea before yes. that it came from a mission and my favorite yeah. i think is still the camera that's in our phones Yes, it's yeah, my favorite one. My my go to that I always tell people, and they're like, "Why do we even fund the space program? It's a waste of money." Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Okay, let's talk about how many medical advances have come indirectly from NASA." And the one I always point to is the uh, the laser that sets up uh, line of sight orbital rendezvous for uh, robotic docking with the ISS. That is such a precise laser that the the laser that that uh, that they use that technology has spun off into LASIK. So because NASA wanted to dock things remotely with the space station, you can have your eyes resurfaced with a laser in like, I don't know how long LASIK takes, um, <laughs> in X amount of time and then be able to see. So like, yes, funding your space, I, I know this is irrelevant to you in Canada, but um, when, especially like it's such a minimal amount of money that goes to NASA, like the funding that goes to your space agency has so many things that you don't even know you interact with every day. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, and if we go back to where you mentioned the Canada Arm, one of the Canadian Space Agency's biggest contributions to um, space exploration, because uh, from that came the Neuro Arm, which they now use to help surgeons perform brain surgery. Oh, oh cool. I didn't yeah. know that. That's awesome. And um, it, it makes a lot of sense the more you think about it, because uh, human hands, like professionals, they're as steady yeah. as they can be, but yeah. nothing's going to be any steadier than yeah. a robotic arm. That's true. That's so, true. And I've seen pictures on it. I think I posted it on my Instagram a couple of weeks ago. But, um, nice. It's a, it looks clunky. I'm not going to lie. It looks quite clunky, yeah. clunky, but it's still a good advancement in the medical sciences that probably yeah. couldn't have come. It probably would have taken longer to develop if it wasn't yeah. for the Canada arm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then there's, there's little things like, uh, I, I looked into once, uh, a NASA engineer was driving to Edward, biking to Edwards air force base one day, almost got knocked over by buff- buffeted by the wind from a passing truck and was like, there has to be a better way to design trucks and space shuttle research directly fed into more streamlined trucks that save fuel for long duration drives <laughs> okay i did not know about you would, that you would never no. know <laughs> nasa helped develop the u.s olympic team's swimsuits to create a boundary layer which is very similar to what happens to a spacecraft re-entering the atmosphere i mean all this stuff is just like <laughs> you would never know and it's everywhere and it's from the like intense medical to like the mundane like the 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 stuff that keeps your thermos working is yeah. is some ther- I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like some thermal material that NASA started developing and the company because it's all contractors and subcontractors all the way down, mm-hmm. right? They can take their stuff and and make other products and it it feeds out of that NASA research. It's so cool. Yeah, and another one that just came to my mind: uh, memory foam for mattresses. Yes. Yeah. So comfy. So yeah. comfy. <laughs> I, I I think it was in NASA's report for spinoff. They said it was designed to make it more comfortable for test pilots. Yeah. It's essentially the main reason they developed it, just to make their yeah. lives a little bit nicer. <laughs> yeah. In a new yeah. vehicle, and now we get to sleep a little bit nicer. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's awesome. Yeah, I always that's why I always love looking at more about space and seeing all these developments because I know something's going to come from yeah. it. It's not going to be yeah, we launched the rocket, what would we do, and then that's it. That's that's the it's the tip of the iceberg. I always I always make the it's the very worn worn out analogy, the tip of the iceberg. But I always say like you know for Apollo, it's like you see the astronauts and you don't see everything that's below it. With NASA, you see the rocket launches and you see nothing else below it. But mm-hmm. that's the bulk of what what you get um yeah yeah no i agree completely and uh if we want to uh, if we want to quickly backtrack for yeah. we were talking about book your books yes 
and yeah. from you went from a blogger to yeah. now an author yeah which is quite a big it's quite a big jump but you said how much you love writing so actually mm-hmm. the jump makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. so that, when was it you realized you know what I enjoy writing about space so much on my blog I want to be able to talk about this in a book so what was it that led you towards that um I, uh, I kind of, like I said, I'd always really loved books. I always wanted to write. I've, it's always been something I've been passionate about. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on this very obscure technology called the Gemini Regalo Wing, which was a uh, land landing system for the Gemini spacecraft, which is NASA's second generation uh, spacecraft. Basically, the idea was to land it on a runway so they could reuse it and not have it you know, get corrupt or corroded by salt water and, and, you know, trying to go towards reusability. It cost $165 million at the time, which is about 2.1 billion by today's standards. Mm. There were two test vehicles built that sent two guys to the hospital and uh, it never flew. It just never flew. And it was just like, I read about this. And I'm like, this is such a cool story that no one's ever heard of. And I had this weird idea. I was like, I think there might be a book in like, cause how many books have there been written about like how we got into space, right? Just the yeah, whole thing. That's, that's, like the big exciting story and I was like what about coming back from space we never give any love to coming back from space so I started exploring these ideas a little bit and that's where the blog came in and gradually I started like I just started honestly dry pitching like a blind pitching agents um and literary people to be like I have this idea and they're like actually and you know they'd give me feedback like I don't think this will sell but what about this and I ended up with this idea for my first book of breaking the chains of gravity which was the prehistory of NASA <laughs> so it, it became a leap from my initial idea of this weird landing system and um I, th- I just realized that like it's a story like deep space nerds know but it's a story that the average person doesn't know because it's always so steeped in like intense technology like there's a way to make it more accessible um and i just i was workshopping it i was working on this proposal and i eventually got um was able to pitch it to a publisher who actually had read publisher had read my blog liked it and was putting together a new science list and asked me if i would ever consider writing a book and i was like actually i have a proposal here you go. And like within two months I had a contract. Um, so that's how it happened. And then it was, you know, from there it was like, well, there's going to be another one at some point. And then it just became a matter of finding the right story. And then having an agent this time around just made it very, very different situation. But, um, it's just the same thing, you know, constantly working on blogs, working on videos now and just playing with ideas. And once you hit a story that feels really big, trying to see if you can flesh it out into something that's book proposal length and, and go from there. No, I I think that's like, it's one, it's just so much initiative. And um, I think as soon as you mentioned uh, history pre-NASA, that the only thing that I really knew but that was pre-NASA would probably be the Sputnik launch, one launch. But that's really all I knew. And um, I think you made a good point that not a lot of people do know a lot about what happens when we come back from space or what built us into actually wanting to go from space. Especially because we always just think of the space race, like what kicks yeah. started that off. Yeah. But then a lot of people would say like, well, it's mainly because America was afraid what Russia might do when they put more things in space. So yeah. they wanted to be on top of everything and be the superpower that they always said they would be. So it, but I think there's like, there's so much more that isn't talked about because I think that does yeah. just cloud everything. Yeah. Which... There's, there's always, there's always, stu- there's always something. And it's, it really just comes down to finding that right little unexplored nook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And from there that you, for after that book, you went and wrote a second book, which I try to remember yeah. the title top of my head, but it was about uh, the women that trained to be astronauts in the 60s. Yes, but they never trained to be astronauts. <laughs> Uh, it's called Fighting for Space, and um, it, this this book is so you. I mean, most people have heard the story of the Mercury Thirteen. The way the story is usually told, thirteen intrepid women started training to be astronauts, but they were kept out of the space program because they were women. And it's sexism, and it's the '60s, and yada yada yada. And um, I started reading that story, and I'm like, none of this lines up with what I know about NASA's history. So, like, let's look at the real story because part of the story was there's always this villain named Jackie Cochran who like swoops out of nowhere she's like a disney villain sorry i don't know if i can curse on your podcast oh she's it's, like it's fine disney villain yeah she <laughs> swoops out of nowhere she comes down from her like castle in the forest thwarts the women who want to fly in space and then just like goes home to hang out with her pet raven and i'm like why she's the foremost female she's the foremost pilot of the 20th century i've never heard of her why is she the villain so i started looking at the story from her perspective and understanding her story and once i did i was like oh 
because there was no women's program. She was trying to set the story straight the whole time. So what this book ended up being was this incredibly deep dive into Jackie Cochran. Um, thankfully, she all of her papers are in the Eisenhower Presidential Library in, in uh, Kansas. So I, I spent a lot of time out there. I have over 6,000 pages from her personal letters and stuff. Um, and I pieced together the story as it actually happened. Because it ends up, the, the book ends up being a dual biography of Jackie Cochran on the one side and Jerry Cobb on the other side. Jerry was the first woman to take the astronaut medical tests and quote unquote qualify for spaceflight. Um, and it really is the two of them going head to head in a, a fight over what the what a female spaceflight program should be. But because the media got wind of it and loved this idea, this novelty of women in space, the media is what started printing articles about female astronauts and like jerry ran with the publicity to try to force nasa to let her into space and jackie's like you know this isn't going to happen and you're making you're making it harder for women because you're pissing everyone off so it ends up being this very complicated very nuanced story of these two women trying to take control of the narrative and there's no there's you know it's it's you, you can't really there's no win at all it's it's just a, a human story and I, I really enjoyed writing it because a i'm so sick of reading the story about it just being straight sexism um because that's so oversimplified but b i love a story where it's it's women fighting to do what they just want to do and also being very imperfect about how they went about it yeah because when i was human. yeah no i completely agree because when i was reading your um summary of the book i was realizing like i actually don't know anything about this that everything I read up to when I was like yeah. a kid going up and going into university that you, you make a good point that NASA doesn't really have a lot of information on this at least not easy to find information yeah. I would say that I think you, you said you had to go to the library to find all oh, of these yeah, letters this, and... this isn't a NASA story I, I actually uh, I have some friends at NASA um, and uh, I sent one of them a copy of the book and he's like I hate this story so much, but I like you, so I'll read your book. <laughs> and, I was, and I just was like, I was like, dude, I think I think you're actually not gonna hate this because for the first time, I actually like don't make NASA the bad guy. NASA is just the organization to give you context. And like, there's you know, there's it's 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 such a complex story with like Lyndon Johnson is a huge part of it. Um, Randy Lovelace, who is the doctor who did the medical test for the Mercury astronauts, as well as some of these women, he's he's a major figure um, as a person. And just like it was really funny, like taking it to people who are like, I'm sick of the story. I'm sick of NASA having to release pr press material saying we never had a program. This was not a program that existed that we canceled. And and yeah, I was like you're going to hate this one less. <laughs> it's just really funny. Uh, but no, I think revealing the, the story more often is actually quite crucial, especially for a lot of the, the our generation that just don't really know about it. Yeah. And it, it's a missing bit of history that we probably should know about instead of... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it too, is like, I, you know, part of it is having as my main figure a wo the first woman to break the sound barrier the first woman to pilot a bomber overseas the first woman to i mean so many firsts um and she's kind of disappeared and it's just really interesting to think like yeah we are constantly celebrating you know the first all-female this it's like women have been doing this stuff since the 30s can we just like call women people <laughs> Can we just say like, look, humans doing cool things instead of making it women as other, which is like a personal pet peeve. But mm -hmm. yeah, so I really like like highlighting all of these incredible female accomplishments that they weren't trying to do it for the sake of being the first woman. They were trying to do it because Jackie really wanted to fly a fast plane, you know, just like the men wanted to do, just wanted to fly fast. Yeah, no, just to get just like it was just all about making sure uh, I just having equality in general, like not having yeah. to fight for it, it shouldn't have been yeah. a struggle in the first place. Yeah. So then what are, your, what are your thoughts on then that NASA using the term a lot, we're going to put the first woman, the next man um, on the moon? I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I would just really like it if we stopped having to separate genders. Um, because it, because it, every time I see it, it makes... It, it feels like tokenism. It feels like you're saying first woman and next man because you want to emphasize the woman. It's like, what if, what if it's just highly specialized, expertly trained crew? And like, look, it just happens to be a very interesting, diverse crew. And that's mm -hmm. just like, we stop having to make it like, instead of being like the crew of astronauts, it's this, the one woman. It's like, well, why, why is she defined by her womanhood? 
her her def she want what if she wants to be defined as an astronaut why are you defining her as a woman because that immediately makes it about her femininity and about her womanness not about the fact that she's extremely qualified and an expert at what she does so i'm really over it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah yeah i i think what oh, hopefully like once it eventually happens they'll stop using these um having to define all these terms differently instead of just saying who they actually yeah. are as a person yeah. as which... individual people yeah. um i'm i'm all for just celebrating the individual people the individual's accomplishments um and not making it you know this 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 woman who's done all this through the military expert pilot yada 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 but she's first and foremost a woman like what if she's first and foremost a pilot <laughs> what if she wants to be first and foremost an astronaut yeah yeah, no, I agree. I think that it definitely needs to be like stopped being used in media a lot more now because it does give us a it gives off a certain message. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And uh, so we're going. So we've gone from blogging. We've gone yeah. from an author. And yeah. then you went YouTuber. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you, it seems thing. like you're checking off all these boxes when it comes to public engagement. So you've yeah. gone from the web to books now to videos yeah what brought what made you want to go to youtube because that's a completely different yeah. platform and whole different yeah. world when it comes i imagine the, vi the videos came before the books the videos came second um i was writing because like when i started writing the blog in 2010 um because i had just come out of a master's degree i was it was very academic writing um in style it was less fun less playful i think um and you know bit dry <laughs> academic writing is not necessarily the most exciting writing of all time um and i i could see i could see that people would comment before um reading the whole thing and i was like there was there are long articles sometimes like two three thousand words and i was like i don't know if people want to watch want to read it all maybe they want to passively listen to it so i started doing videos it was just and it used to be these like very short condensed versions of the blog with the idea being like you watch this for two minutes and then you go read the whole thing um and at first i did like the intro and outro and then i just put pictures up over a vo because i did not know how to be on camera <laughs> at all <laughs> um and then and then it started with like okay what if i do the short video and it points to the blog but it stands alone okay what if the video is a teaser introduction pushing you to the blog and eventually i settled on it's been i mean it's been how many years now started YouTube in 2012. Um, it's been many years. <laughs> and eventually it just became like, screw it. Some people don't want to read. So now I just do the exact same content on YouTube as I put up on my blog. Um, because some people want to listen passively. Some people want to watch. So there's some B-roll. Um, and really, yeah, it just became a way to try to reach people with a different, with a different media because some people don't want to read. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's different. It's, I finally settled into a way that makes it less painful from like a, cause like I also don't have a crew. I mean, I have a cat. He's not good cause he doesn't, he's, I mean, he's the best, but he doesn't have thumbs so he can't edit. Um, but like learning, you know, it was a whole other learning curve of learning how to learn, learning how to shoot, learning how audio works, learning how to edit it, learning how to use the resources for video, um, learning how to be on camera. That was a whole other beast to learning how to actually do it. Um, I, tried really hard. I finally got a teleprompter last year so I can actually write these very intense, really detailed scripts without having to worry about misremembering a date. And um, yeah, it's just, it's settled in, but it's, that was a whole other learning curve. No, I, I remember when uh, trying to like set up, uh, getting used to, as you mentioned, getting used to programming, getting used to sound and audio. Yeah. Um, I remember, like, I only just recently got this microphone. I know the audience can't see it, but it took me <laughs> a lot longer than I want to admit to get it to work because yeah. I was going like, oh, why is this so complicated? Yeah. And I look at, like, when I was looking at your YouTube videos and I look at other YouTube videos, I always think, like, everyone seems so natural and um, outgoing and confident on it. But if someone yeah. puts a camera in front of me, I don't know what to do. <laughs> just My brain just goes like, emergency shutdown let's just hope everyone that goes away <laughs> yeah oh dude my uh the first time i ever did anything on camera like live on camera um not live but like you know not just in my house where i could redo it 50 times uh, i i guest hosted a show uh with a good friend of mine i don't even remember the name of the show anymore but his his co-host is out of town he asked me to come in and fill in uh, it was just like a science news show just kind of a little a, a youtube thing and Oh, I'm sitting there and like the desk was a little bit because I'm very I'm very short. Um, 
I feel like even in the shot right now, you can see that I'm very short. Um, so the desk felt really high. So it felt weird to have my arms on the desk. So I was just sitting there with my hands in my lap, like reading the stuff on the off the prompter that was like my interest and having a conversation. And I look terrified. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. Um, but I um, I got the opportunity in 2014. I started, I worked with D News for four years. It's now called Seeker. It was Discovery Channel's digital uh, YouTube show. So it was science news. We wrote and, and hosted these little five, minute shorts um about anything and that that was really fun to to learn you know i i covered oh, chimerism i mean so i don't even remember how many different episodes i wrote but like so many different things and that's where i kind of really got good practice in being a communicator of general science too um and doing that for four years really taught me how to be comfortable on camera. And it, it, just took, it just took time. It just took a lot of time. But it eventually now, like, I started streaming on Twitch last year, too. And it's really weird. My mom actually watches my streams sometimes. <laughs> and she's like, I don't know how you went from being a shy little girl to being able to talk alone in your house to an audience of 500 people. And you're, you're fine. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know either. But it's, it becomes natural after a while. Yeah, it's very like it's always like this practice makes perfect. And yeah. it, it can't be more true, especially if someone yeah. comes out starting as an introvert and yeah. it's like, I don't know what to do. And then the yeah. next thing you know, they look they're acting like an extrovert. And you're like, what the heck yeah. happened to you? <laughs> yeah. It helps when you're doing stuff that you love. Like with my YouTube stuff, you know, even though it's scripted and it's just me in the house, it's so it feels very like insular to do it. I just I love like I'm working on one right now about the Corona spy satellites and it was just it's so it's so cool. Like I'm so excited to share it. So it's it's fun to it's a little bit easier to kind of get into it and, and have that show up on camera when you really do love the topic that you're working on. It's something that you're passionate about. And, you know, I've spent weeks researching this stuff. It's like, finally, I get to share it. So that that helps too. Yeah. And it also helps, I think, as you mentioned, that not everyone likes to read information. They prefer to yeah. watch a short video. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. That has been me on some occasions for okay. certain topics. I mean, I could read an entire paper or I can find a video that does explains the whole thing in 10 minutes. And then I can, yeah. come, I can go away actually knowing the information yeah. because I feel like visually I can learn better. I think, yeah, I, this is one thing I remember learning about a little bit um, in undergrad. It's just different styles of learning. Like I'm so visual, I can't do audiobooks or podcasts, which I feel is is ironic maybe being on a podcast right now. <laughs> Not really, but um, I, al I always joke that Alanis Morissette like destroyed an entire generation's understanding of the word irony because nothing in her song ironic is actually ironic. So yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, if I'm listening to something you know, I'm listening to a podcast, so I clean the house or something. I just, I don't hear the information because I'm focusing on what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm someone that reads. I can't watch a video and take in the information, but I understand that other people are the polar opposite of me. So yeah, I actually, I'm one of those people that has to handwrite to remember things. Okay. Yeah, I, that is for me. I mean, I, no one can see it, but I actually have sticky notes in front of um, yeah, nice. my camera here. These are mainly like motivational quotes to make sure I can actually write my thesis. Uh, uh, but, yeah, that's yeah, a good one. <laughs> because um, writing for me is like my weakest skill that I've still been trying to develop. Yeah. Because before it was always speaking. I was better yeah. at speaking and creating yeah. visuals than actually writing. But I yeah. know that when it comes to academia, if you, you, most people read. So you need to yeah. be able to write everything down. Write. Yeah. yeah, especially if you stay in academia, there's always publishing quotas to meet. There's always there's it's a huge written component. So getting comfortable with that is is vital for sure. Yeah, it, it's tricky because I have to literally take myself out of the comfort zone. Yeah, to do it. But yep. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes getting out of your comfort zone is great because it gives you new skills which you never know you're going to need or want down the line. Um, but also sometimes pushing yourself into doing all the things that don't feel great reinforces what you don't like and helps you just kind of you know figure out what you want to do by process of elimination <laughs> um yeah no i agree and sometimes you may end up realizing you're actually better at something yeah. that you thought you'd be yeah bad or terrified at doing yeah but no yeah and so we want to so when you when you started creating all these videos which then led to you um writing books I have to think that like, you started to engage people differently, I would imagine, when you from the book world, the blogging world, and yes. the YouTube world. Yes. How did you find um, publicly engaging about space on these different, essentially these different platforms? Yeah. So yeah. it must have been a learning curve for yourself. Yeah, and it still it still is because you can't you can't approach all audiences the same way. Because um, I still I still have it when I'm 
you know, if I'm giving a, a public talk, I have to kind of tweak the talk based on the audience. If it's a, you know, if it's a literary, if it's like a book convention or something, I kind of have to change the way I approach the topic. If it's a science or a space convention, I change the way I do it. So it's kind of puts the right stuff forward. Um, even even the way I write for video is very different than the way I write the blog. And the two things go together. Like I write the video and then I slightly edit it to make it the blog post just to take out the... I mean, I write my inflections. I write ways like very, very not poor grammar, but like very poor punctuation because it's how I speak. That sounds like I don't speak well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like instead, you know, you you just you have more more pauses. You have more commas. You like overemphasize the 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 structure of the way you want to sound, not the way it's grammatically correct to put your punctuation in. So I always have to go in and do that. But like, it is really different to sit down and write a script knowing that it's going to be read trying to make it such that someone will feel like you're having a conversation with them versus writing a blog, which you want to feel a little bit more, more um, proper versus writing a book, which, you know, can take on any tone. Like I said, this fighting for space is meant to be feel, really feel like you're reading a narrative, like it's narrative, but like almost like you're reading fiction. Like I wanted to take you out. I didn't want to sit there and be like, and according to this letter, this was said, you know, I, I hate that personally. I just hate it. So, you know, taking the letters and, you know, instead of, instead of Jackie wrote this, that, you know, she felt this because she wrote it in a letter. So I know that's what she felt. So being able to kind of translate that in a way that draws people in very differently because, you know, in God, how many words? 120,000 words. You have a lot of room to play with. And you can, you know, flesh all this stuff out and let the story happen. Whereas, you know, a blog, you have to be very contained. So it is. It's it's all practice. It's, it's all been, I mean, I've been doing it for over 10 years now. It's just all been practice of like how to engage different audiences. And it's honestly, it's all trial. Trial and error. Like the metaphorical. Because don't actually throw a pot of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. But, you know, trying different types of content. Trying different approaches. One thing that, I, that I've really struggled with that I feel like, you know, considering your, your academia and I feel like people that listen to this might be more on the academic side of things or kind of straddling those, the world of academia and uh, science communication. Um, it's also really hard to find the happy medium of details. Because there's always going to be those people who get mad at you for not having every single detail of a story, but then you have to remember, like, who do you want to reach? Do you want to reach the 10 people who already know the story? Like, or do you want to reach the, the thousand people who have never heard of this and are interested in it and don't need to know the serial number of the oxygen tank on Apollo 13 that ruptured? Um, so I put that in, I actually put that serial number in the blog because you can just skim over it and not pay attention to it, but I don't think I put it in the video because that's an unnecessary detail that's going to throw off the audience who's listening. So there's always this, this play of making sure it's the right level of detail without overwhelming your audience. It's a, it's a, and that's a very tough walk to line, especially when you're doing science. You have to kind of figure out like, you know, I, people get mad at me all the time when I talk about reentry heating and I just, I say reentry heating. Unless we're talking about reentry specifically, in which case I go into detail about how the plasma works. So you have to, you know, you oversimplify a little bit sometimes when it's secondary to your main goal for the audience that you're trying to reach. And you're never going to make everyone happy and you have to be okay with that. And that's the hard, that is the hardest part, <laughs> that is the hardest part is, is you, I want to get every detail in, I want to get everything right, but I can't, I can't make a video that's, that's 85 minutes long when it needs to be 20 because no one's going to watch it. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, finding that happy medium. I agree. It's like extremely challenging. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of institutions, especially even if schools, I feel like, I hope it's a little bit better now that you're not really taught how to try and even find it, let alone attempt to find it, that you're only really taught to go down one particular communication route, especially yeah. in academia, which I think has gone a bit better now that they've realized how important science communication actually is, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to getting funding, which I'm surprised no one realized this sooner. <laughs> if you can't talk, if someone outside your field can't understand your work, yeah. how are they going to know it's worth funding or yeah. even care about it? Yeah, You might and, care and about it. Your supervisor might care about it. Your friend might care about it. But if that person with the bag of money doesn't care about yeah. it, well, then what's the point of trying the, to continue? The best way I have, um, the best way I've figured out how to explain science communication to people who ask about it is think about 
you're explaining something super weird and super dense that you love to your drunk friend. <laughs> You've got their attention for two minutes before something shiny is going to distract them, but you have to hook them right away. You don't, you don't have to go down all the details with every single player, every single name. You have to hook them with the meat of the story, and then if they want to know more, you give them the details. But your drunk friend has a very limited attention span. That's basically the internet. The internet is your drunk friend. You got to hook them with something that comes, comes and draws them in real fast. And if that video, like, that's why you have the cold open, that's like, here's what we're going to do. You try to bring them into that narrative, and then the blog always has a bit more detail that just feels superfluous to the main story. So, yeah. I've never heard of the drunk friend example. Um, well, because <laughs> I don't it... <laughs> know why that came up, but I think it was like I was out for drinks with a friend of mine, and um, we're both in in SciComm and talking about like how how amazingly hard it can be to get people excited about something that's so cool. And it was like, yeah, because they're basically like like they're because we're sitting there having a beer. It's like I guess they're, it's like they're drunk because they just get distracted easily. And I'm like, yeah, yep, it's the drunk friend problem. <laughs> So that's always the analogy. And I say that I've never actually tried to explain. Actually, that's not true. That's not true. I, I met a, this is so weird. I met a band in Melbourne, Australia once um, who I told them why I was in the country and it was doing a lecture tour. And um, they, they were like, they, everyone was drinking in this pub. And uh, they asked me like, what about the, the rocket? Like I keep seeing this big rocket, but I don't know anything about it. And I gave them like the two minute breakdown of the Saturn V to these drunk strangers who were so excited about it. And they don't need to know the details. They don't need to know about the dual bulkhead or the, the joint bulkhead on the S2 stage, which I actually think is a very cool engineering part because um, they it didn't have separate tanks. So the bulkhead had to just be both sides, which was a very strange pressure issue. Anyways, they don't need to know that. They just need to know how big it was, how powerful it was, what it did, where it came from. The drunk friend problem. I might actually use this. <laughs> I think no, I actually might because the because I, as soon as you said that, it reminded me when my I was trying to write for a really big grant and I was extremely nervous about it because it was my first yeah. one ever. And my supervisor said, "Okay, try to think you're explaining that your research to an eight year old. Yeah, that eight year old can understand what you're talking about. You have no problem with the um, committee that's going to be reviewing this because yeah. an eight year old can understand it." I feel like. The thing with within the academic world too is is it's very in, it gets to be inside baseball, right? Within your discipline, you all speak the same language, but when you go to another discipline, they don't. Um, so you have to kind of go down to average reading comprehension level, which I think is something like the eighth grade level um, or ninth grade level, um, and that that might be, and I might be misremembering this. I think that's the, and that might be America, um, but that's the average reading comprehension for people. So when you think about it someone that's not in your discipline doesn't know the details of your language. So you kind of have to break it down to that, that level just to make sure that they get it and then they'll get it. And then you go into more detail, but it's always like explain to an eight year old is not a bad way to think about it. Yeah. And um, like you've gotten to have this so many chances to talk about all these different missions to probably someone that's probably never even heard of um, one of the Mercury missions or probably yeah. some people don't realize that even though there are seven Apollo missions, only six actually made it. Yeah. But do a lot of people actually realize that? Probably I mean, a lot. I mean, I know a ton of people who okay, they've everyone's heard of Apollo Eleven and everyone's heard of Apollo Thirteen because Tom Hanks. No one knows the average person doesn't know about the other missions, and that's that's nothing to say anything bad about them. Of course not. It's not not everybody sits around and reads the Apollo mission transcripts, which I have, which means that people know about it. So you have a starting point. So you can bring them in very briefly on like, actually, Apollo 17 was the last. And like they did, and I don't know offhand what I'm, what I'm getting at, but you can like draw them in. Like, here's starting point. Did, you know, they, they went much more. Like Apollo 17 did this and this is super cool. Like, I had no idea. Like, there you go. You learned something just now. And then the odds are they'll come back and like, I want to know more about that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So always it's always, yeah, you, you can't, you, there, there's, a, there's so much that people don't know and they don't need to know every single detail. They might want it eventually, but you can always start with an eight-year-old. Yeah, and if they do want to know more details, even if you either don't have the time or you don't have the detail information for you, you can always point them in the right direction. So yeah. like, if you want to learn more, I'd highly recommend this book, this site. Yeah, 
I feel like that's another really important thing that people don't like <laughs> to admit with science communication. It's like, it's okay to say that you just don't know something. <laughs> Cause like I had someone, this is so, this is so funny. I had someone in my Twitch stream the other day and like, I, I, I play video games. I, like it's not a science stream at all. Like we chat about science a bit, but someone came in and was asking me about re-entry angles for Apollo missions. And I was just like, this is like, we're, we're talking about not space right now. And you hit me with this. I'm like, <laughs> Honestly, I know what reentry angles are. I know that there is a window too shallow you burn up, too too or too shallow you skip off, too deep, too uh, steep. That's the word. Um, you burn up in reentry. I do not know what the numbers are. I would have to look it up, even on a good day, even not currently playing video games. I would have to stop and look it up because I don't know. And it's just like. Just don't fake it. There are so many people that try to just like bullshit their way through it. It's like, just say, you know what? I got, I got to go look it up. I know where to find it. I can look up the information. I'll find it. Mm -hmm. And just be okay that like, you know what? I don't actually know about that. I'm going to learn that. And then I'll share my knowledge. It's okay to learn things. But no, I do agree. I think um, it's sometimes just having to say, I don't know, trying to, f and then I'll say, I'll go look for the information. Yeah. It's probably better to admit you don't know than to try and, as you said, BS your way to yeah. giving an answer yeah. that probably isn't even right. And then yeah. they're going to be misled and it's just going to be a domino effect from yeah. there on. Yeah. Then on. There's, a, there's a, a strange culture, I feel, of not wanting to admit you, you're wrong. And I, I had the experience, I did it when I was first researching, um, first started researching the this topic for fighting for space, I, you know, the classic Mercury 13 narrative came up and I ended up being invited to give a TEDx talk about it. And I did. And three years later and three years of research into the topic later, I had to admit that I was wrong. And instead of letting the internet tear me apart, I tore myself apart and it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I watched my TEDx talk back and I did a live commentary and just like I recorded it and put up a video of like me tearing apart my TEDx talk and then was at the end of the day like sometimes you research things and you learn more and that's okay. You're allowed to be wrong as long as you're still learning and that's fine. <laughs> So. Yeah. No, yeah, no, it's completely fine. I sometimes look at some of the old stuff I've written. I think, why the heck did I write write that? That's yep. not even correct. Or what was going through my mind? Yeah. But it's funny how you mentioned that video. I actually just um, I've watched that video of <laughs> you going talking through your TED talk and going, nope, yeah, nope, uh, yeah. dates wrong. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's it's one of those things you got to learn at some point. And the you know, if you do science communication, sometimes you end up having to learn publicly. And um, yeah, the you know, at the end of the day. I did a I did so much more research than I ever thought I was gonna I found stuff that I didn't even know existed in researching for this book. Um and it was it was a fun way, it was actually at the end of the day a really fun way to share um how much I learned and just make it, you know, make it an education thing for for um, in multiple ways. So yeah. It was a fun video. <laughs> Yeah, it was a fun video to watch. I, if anyone's listening, I highly recommend um, <laughs> not just watching the video. Check out the channel. You could learn a lot from a lot of these uh, the short videos you can about very random missions and very cool yeah, uh, space technology as well. Yeah. So, Amy, I actually want to get into the question portion right. of the podcast. And so, the first question is: If you if you wanted a mission to go to any celestial body in our solar system, where would you want it to go? Um. There's a few that I really want to see. Um, I am very keen for more Venus missions. Um, I'm keen on a, a Titan mission, Saturn's moon Titan. The other one that I really want to see, I want a dedicated Neptune slash Triton mission. Um, because we know so little about the outer planets. And, um, you know, Neptune and Uranus, we've only done the one flyby of with Voyager 2. So um, I want to go back to those. But the, So I, I worked with the New Horizons team on the mission to Pluto doing uh, videos for communication for the mission. I did a, a, a minute-long video every day for a month, and it was so cool and so much fun. And um, one thing we noticed from the, the images, or well, the imaging team noticed, and then they told me all about it. <laughs> is that uh, Pluto from the images looks a lot like Neptune's moon Triton. And there is a theory that these two bodies are actually like bodies and there may be more out there and that um, Neptune somehow captured one being Triton and not quite the other being Pluto because Neptune actually does have a significant effect on uh, Pluto's orbit. It actually, Pluto becomes, in, uh, begins orbits inside Neptune for, I think it's like, 20 years every 200 years something i can't remember the, exactly the stats so again don't quote me on it i can look it up for you but anyways um 
So I think that's really interesting, given that we are starting to get more more interested in the outer solar system and like getting into the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud. I would love to know more about the moons of the gas giants, because I think there's a lot we might want to know. Also, it's just been way too long since we've done Neptune and Uranus, and I want to go to those places. Uh, I think Uranus and Neptune are definitely owed a mission. They've been the yeah. ignored children of the solar system yeah. lately. Yeah. Even their distant, further distant... Uh, I want to say very young sibling Pluto yeah. has gotten more attention yeah. than they have and they're massive. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it and does it's, make you wonder. I know. And I don't, I like, I don't even know enough about Uranus to know why I would want a mission there, which is why I put Neptune above it because, <laughs> because I'm very curious about the likeness of the moon to Pluto. But um, I think there's a lot to learn from those two ice giants. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's funny how you mentioned um, Dragonfly and Titan, because I think those will, that's going to be a, such a cool mission. I, when it, did it that gets get there. funded? Is it, is it going? It did. It's it announced. Did. It is. Okay. I thought I saw that, but I, I feel like, oh God, you never, you never count it until it's launched. Cause like it could be announced, it could get funded, it could be cut, it could be changed. So, you know. No, yeah. it's it's official. My supervisor, she's nice. actually a co eye. Oh, so. that's very cool. Nice. Yeah, so she that's was awesome. ecstatic when yeah. she realized they were selected. Yeah. And you mentioned Venus. Uh, there's two proposals. For yeah, some a friend of mine's a co eye on one of them, and okay. I'm very excited to see if he get his gets chosen. But um, yeah, no, there's there's so much stuff. And is it a Discovery class mission? Well, I don't dragonfly? know the top of my head. I want to say a dragonfly. Yes, I believe. Yeah, but again. I keep thinking New Frontiers and Discovery mixed up. Yeah. I think it's a Discovery Yeah, I can mission. never remember the, the details. I, I always have to look it up and double check it before I say it. But yeah. I do know that Discovery class missions are like, they always yield so much more than you expect and they're great. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, there's, they take longer to start, though, yeah. which is the only downside. Because yeah, like Dragonfly is 20, 30. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, we got a while yeah. to wait, but it's going to happen. Yeah. And that's the main thing. Not to mention, depending on the size of your rocket, you're going to have to do a ton of flybys to get there, to get your, it's, it, it, yeah. Yeah. I don't I it's would gonna... have to look up how long it takes, but like, it takes a long time to get to those places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's going to be a long wait, but I think the ending is going to be yeah. worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And so for the second question, uh, earlier we already talked about spinoff technology. Yeah. And I think you already quoted quite a couple of the ones you really like. Because the question is, was going to be, what is your favorite spinoff technology? Um, so, unless you have another one in uh, somewhere that you'd like to mention. I don't think I have another one off the top of my head. Um, there is, I forget what exactly the tech is, but there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that has been done. I think it's with the different lasers that are used for very precise movements. Because there's one also that is, is starting to replace um, mammogram technology that makes it a lot easier for cancer screenings for women. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it, it is a Ness spinoff. So this is a terrible example, but it's a very cool tech. <laughs> um, no, I, I still think my go-to, I think the coolest one is LASIK. I just love the idea of a laser that helps guide a robot, also reshapes your eyes. Obviously not actually the same laser, but like, it's just such a cool, it's such a cool connection between those two. No, I think it is a really cool con uh, connection. And I think that spin-off technology was mentioned in the very first episode of this podcast oh, nice. so it is a it's a trending one yeah i yes. can say a lot <laughs> which is very good and so for the final question this is the diaries of space explorers so i wanted to ask you and you've talked about quite a lot who is your favorite space explorer uh pete conrad <laughs> Oh, that was a quick one. <laughs> yeah, um, I know I know it's a podcast, but I can show you. I have a Pete Conrad action figure who lives on my desk. Uh, you can even see, kind of, his little gap tooth. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Pete Conrad was the commander of Apollo 12 um, and also flew on uh, Gemini 5 and Gemini 11. Apollo 12 was the, the second lunar landing mission. They had so much fun. They were like three best friends going on the ultimate road trip to the moon. And um, it was learning about that mission when I was in high school that made me feel like this, the human stories are the ways to translate and communicate this stuff. And I just loved it because it was it made space for me. I was I was, you know, nine or ten when I first learned about the mission. It made space feel accessible. Like I can understand it when someone it's through someone else's experience. And I've, I've just since been a huge fan of the Apollo 12 crew. Um, and, and I don't know why exactly. I've always really gravitated to Pete of the three of them. I've met, I've met two of the crew. I've met uh, Dick Gordon and Al Bean, both of whom have passed. Uh, Pete Conrad died before I, you know, I was 15 or 14. So I never got a chance to meet him, but uh, my cat is actually named Pete Conrad. 
<laughs> um, I have a few Pete Conrad autographs that I bought on eBay. My favorite being the AT&T check that he signed, <laughs> um, which is framed along with a picture, an old press photo I bought. Um, yeah, so I Pete Conrad, He's he made me realize that space was just fun and goofy and that it was ultimately at the end of the day, whatever, you know, epic movie you want to put under a montage of rockets launching, it was just a bunch of dudes doing shit. Um, <laughs> space at the end of the day is a bunch of dudes. I mean, I have had conversations with astronauts that get into just like astronauts are just at the end they're they're always you know goofy fighter pilots and have the emotional maturity and sense of humor of a 12 year old boy and it's hilarious <laughs> and it's just like they're just people they're just humans and that that was just such a a stupid revelation to have to have but i it it just made, it was a game changer for me to really focus on the fact that it was just humans who went to the moon humans who go to space humans who build the things just humans no, I think it's a great revelation. I mean, it shows you that they are serious when it comes to their mm -hmm. job and about what they will love and the passion for space. But at the same time, that as you said, they're still people. Yeah. They still like to joke. They still like to clown around when they need to. They yeah. still need like to let off steam yeah. because it's a it's a stressful job. Yeah. So you can if yeah. they weren't, then I can't imagine how <laughs> what could be going through their head yeah. if they never tried to let some steam off. Yeah. Every now and then. Yeah. So. So yeah, Pete Conrad. Pete Conrad. All Other right. Pete and... Conrad is sleeping behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone can see it, see him, but I think he's just chilling on the, the couch in the background. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, Amy, I wanted to, to thank you for coming onto the podcast. It was really uh, lovely speaking with you about science communication, the cl clowning of astronauts, and getting to learn about how you've gone from blogger to YouTuber, then to author. So it's such a big transition, and I hope a lot of people can learn that you don't have to go straight into academia to communicate science or even to research about space in general yeah um thank you so much for having me i, I hope this has been somewhat useful if a disjointed conversation <laughs> oh this is my favorite though yeah. <laughs>Thank you for listening to the Diaries of Space Explorers. It was a pleasure to speak with AB Title and learn about her journey discovering space, starting her YouTube channel, Vintage Space, and becoming a space writer. If you would like to learn more about Amy's work, watch her videos, or order one of her books, go to her website at www.amyshearatitle.com or follow her on Twitter at amyshearatitle. I have been your host, Gavin Tullamedi, and if you would like to learn more about the podcast, you can email us at thediveofspaceexplorers at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at Diaries of Space, or on Instagram at Diaries of Space Explorers. We are always looking for new guests to talk about space and to connect the general public to the space sector to bring awareness about what space exploration can bring back down to Earth. Thank you for listening. See you all next time. <laughs>